uh, yeah, 357. Yeah, any other questions for the house before I move on to actually solving the problems? Can we do problem two first? It's okay, problem one will go by really, really fast. No. It's, I, I think this whole review will be really quick. Um, I probably, I'll probably spend like about as much time fumbling with like not unmuting. Wait, so was I muted from the start of the stream? Uh... No. So what? How did I get muted? I don't get it. Uh, whatever. Okay. Um, I still get it. Like, it was working fine, and then it stopped working? Question mark? Whatever. Uh, okay. So, all right. I'm going to do problem one because it is fast. Um, so, because it was mentioned already, um, problem one is actually... The original version of the problem actually literally was show that the process will eventually terminate. Um, and then we decided that was probably actually too easy. And so now it became like a min-max problem. Anyways, uh, I, the solution that I posted on AOPS is basically the whole game. Uh, and... <laughs> is this Russian? Maybe? I don't know. Basically, the idea is you look at things of this picture. Um, you look at triples of the following shape. Where... You have a rock duck that faces a scissors duck that faces a paper duck. And every time a move happens... Uh number of such triples decreases by um, A, B, C. One, one of A, B, or C, according to which one happens. And because initially number of triples is at most A, B, C, so upper bound on moves is A, B, C over the largest uh, largest? Sorry, smallest of ABC. Is the same idea as Yosemite 2003? Yeah. A lot of these, like... It is a pretty standard invariance problem. I would say on the whole, like... The... All, most of day one, I think, was pretty... Experience favoring. In some way or another. Um, why the duck flavor text? Literally no reason. Uh, the fact that we ended up playing Duck Hanabi was a uh, nice coincidence, but I just... When I was copy editing the desks, I was like, I want to put some animal in, and then I just chose ducks, but... And then that happened. <laughs> okay, cool. So that gives you the upper bound of the number of moves, and because of the way this proof works, um... Well, it also tells you when the equality should happen, right? Equality is, the optimal situation is if the number of triples, for this to work, the number of triples has to be exactly ABC, and you always need the same type of duck to move. So you can just do that. What you do is uh, you put the ducks such that all the rock ducks are together, all the paper ducks are together, all the scissor ducks are together, like that. And if the minimum is the number of things, is the number of rocks stuck, so say without loss of generality, this is the min, you have all the scissors stuck, trade plates with all the paper ducks, that is exactly B times C moves. So that's the construction. Quack. Quack. Yeah, after like playing a Dokanabi for like two weeks, <laughs> I, 
I, I can hear the duck sound as well. <laughs> What is duck gonna be? Okay, okay. Uh, let's let's do some culture. Um, one moment, please. Uh, oh man, I play so much Hanapi that the duck games are actually buried. So, this is what Hanabi looks like, right? Um, oh crap. No, 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 no. Uh, hold on. Okay, yeah, it looks like this. And you know, you clue cards and so on. You'll notice that in Han normally, um, when you play Hanabi, you clue someone by, you know, telling them the number or color, but in Duck Hanabi, you just quack at them, so the clue touches some cards, and no one knows anything about the number or color. They just know. <laughs> the clues are all just quack, so you know that these two cards share some property, and you have no idea what it is. And then the cards somehow play anyways. That's Duck Hanabi. And on the website, um, the... They, they, normally when you make a clue, like there's a sound that goes like dun dun or whatever for, for, um, play, for giving a clue, but the website actually has a duck sound, like the clue just goes wah. So the whole game, you just go here, wah, 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 over and over. Uh, that's duck on a beat. Uh, for Eknor Wall, yes, I did do the fire quackers puzzle. So for people who like duck on a beat, I, you know, this puzzle's good enough, I'll, uh, well, the whole hunt is really good. Um, there's recently a puzzle hunt called Teammate Hunt, uh, you may or may not have seen it, but if you go into here, if you like puzzles, there is a duck hanabi puzzle where, um, you watch some ducks play hanabi, and the ducks are really bad. Like, I think from playing a lot of hanabi, uh, working through the game was really painful because the first thing they do is discard a 5, and then it goes downhill from there. Um... <laughs> Okay, uh, and digression. <laughs> Rerun? Wait, what happened? Uh, nothing. I just wrote up solution to the problem and people started asking about ducks. That, that's basically it. Uh, oh, no, no, no. This is a, this is the special TSTST review stream. It is not a rerun. I hope you could tell. <laughs> Let's do the geo. But see, if people can't eat, tell the difference between reruns and non-reruns... Uh... Thinking. Okay, so, for the Geo, um... I'm gonna put the diagram on the left. I mean, it is a harmonic quad, though. So I'm going to present the maximally polished solution. Like, I think as I solve this problem, every time I look at this problem, I was able to cut the length of my solution by like another 20%. So this is about the, as, this is about maximally short. Um, originally I had like a lot more points written. I had like the arc midpoints drawn in. I had EF intersect BC drawn in. And I expect a lot of people will have that. Um, you don't need it though. Also, uh, as the elephant in the room, yes, as far as American Geo goes, uh, this is about as classical as Geo gets. Like. So, the main thing is, like, this point Q is a uh, point that I expect people to know things about. Um, like, for me, like, I had seen the stuff about Q before, and I'd never seen the point G before. So, for me, I had a lot of I had a lot of fun with this problem anyways, because it was trying to figure out what to do with this G. Um, but let me talk about Q. The point Q satisfies, like, two very important properties. Um, one is that Q is the intersection of AEF intersect ABC, and the second is that QD bisects angle BQC. 
yeah, no, like, the reason that everyone is flaming this problem on the forums is because they see the point Q and they immediately they are like, oh yeah, I've seen the point Q before, and then they like throw a party because they're really happy they recognize one point. Uh, but I don't know. There's, there's a second point in the problem. <laughs> it does turn out that someone found G in like, I don't know. Uh, it was apparently on Wu's like GGG contest and also some, I forget the other one. I barrow whatever the thread says. There, so, someone found the links. Um, you say this mo junior six. Okay, I mean, you say this, but like this problem was almost the six. <laughs> uh, like actually, th this problem was almost the twenty twenty six. Uh, but this has been way too easy for you. See. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I can talk about this problem because, like, now it's out. It's hard for me to say very much about the rest of the Yzma selection process, but, like... <laughs> you guys say everything is well known, but, like... You know, you look at the reviewers, they haven't seen half this stuff, so I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, um, let me prove the properties I promised you. Um, so... The main one, first, is to show that Q lies on AEF. I'm going to make a stronger claim that Q is the inverse of P with respect to the in-circle DEF. I mean, you can find the QGBC claim for the, like, you can definitely find, like, QBGC is harmonic in, like, literature somewhere. Like, the couple prompts coded, some handout, whatever. But, like, I don't know. I think as a rule of thumb, if I haven't seen something before, I don't consider it too well known to use in a contest. <laughs> uh, just saying. Uh, so yeah, here's the inverse of P, and the reason is that inversion around DEF sends ABC to 9 point circle. So A will go to the midpoint. When you invert around the end circle, it sends A to this midpoint, B to this midpoint, C to this midpoint. So this point P is on there, and what happens is like so the green circle is now the inverse of line EF, while the circumcircle is the inverse of the nine point circle. Both of these pass through P, ergo IPQ collinear. If you don't know this, is this is something that is actually worth knowing. Um, I put this... This is like one of the things I will make everyone do when they learn inversion, is to prove that IPQ collinear. Like... You, if you haven't seen this before and you want to know inversion well, please work this out. This is important. Um, yeah. The other part is that... To show that QD bisects BQC, the proof that I think is cleanest is what you do is you say there is a spiral similarity at Q, which sends segment BF to EC, and so this spiral similarity gets QB over QC equals BD over DC. Oh, uh, sorry, BF over EC. But because they're the in-circle things, this is equal to BD over DC. Is this the same Q as TST 2011-7? Uh, let me... I don't know if I've seen that problem. Let me check. USA... Oh, jeez. Maybe? I'm not sure. Yeah, um, anyways, via spiral IQ you get this, so the anger bisector theorem gives you this. So again, the thing, I, yeah, the thing, the reason people are talking about this problem is because these are things that um, people have seen. But where by people I mean like 
Uh, the music doesn't feel fitting. Uh, yeah, it's kind of obnoxious. Skip. Uh. In the sense that I think the people who have done like a substantial amount of the IMO shortlist and recent problems probably have seen this property. Um, on the other hand, you'll see people in AOPS complaining that literally everyone knows this, which is definitely not true because, yeah, look at the scores. <laughs> okay, um, what about the other half of the problem? So... So the other half of the problem is dealing with Q, and there's some ways you can do it, but the cleanest one is, I think, to use harmonic bundles in the following way. So we're going to start with this QGBC, and my goal is to, my claim is that this quadrilateral is harmonic. The reason is I can project through the point A onto the line EF. Sorry, no, yeah. QGBC, yeah, cool. Onto line EF, and what is the intuition behind inversion? Um, there's a couple of possible answers. One is the thing I keep saying, which is that a lot of people have seen this before. Like, if you ever do inversion with me in person, or if you read ECMO or whatever, this is one of the first exercises I make people do um, to show that this IPQR collinear. Um, I would say if you want to motivate it, the reason is that if you think that Q is on the green circle, then both the green circle and the blue circle behave very well with respect to inversion around the end circle. One of them goes to line EF, the other goes to the nine point circle. So you should get something and that something you get is what you want. Um, what am I looking at, Dajun Power? Uh, okay, are you new to this? Okay, so um, this is a team selection test review stream. So about last Thursday, there was a uh, there was an International Math Olympia team selection test held in the United States. Um, there were three problems. The problems look like this. And I am presenting the solutions to the problems now for people's entertainment. Um, listen, listen. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> but we are pretending to do math. Um, cool. So from QGBC Harmonic, I'm going to project onto line EF. That's sort of like the only reasonable point line to project onto, and the reason is, like, I want to... G is the point that I don't know anything about, so I want to try to get rid of it. And this will give me four points. It will give me A, Q, intersect, E, F. It will give me P, it will give me F, it will give me E. Okay, so this point really sucks as well, but I can get rid of it by projecting through Q. And when I project through Q, um, where do I go? Let's go onto the green circle. I'll get A, uh, I, F, E. And quadrilateral AFIE is a kite. It lives in the circle of diameter AI, so this cross ratio is negative one. So that shows you that this quadrilateral is harmonic. And that will basically do it. Because what happens is, let's look at angle BQC, right? Angle BQC, um, QG is a semi-median because of the harmonic quad, and QM is a median. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, as I said, there's many, many approaches you can do. This is what I have as, like, excluding the parts about Q, like, this part you can change in different ways as well. But I think this is about as short as I could get the solution um, after recognizing the point Q. So yeah, QG and QM are a semi-median median, so they're isogonal, and we know from here that QD is the angle bisector. Other way around is also true. When I look at the GC, um, GQ, is a C median, GM is a median, and GD is also an angle bisector because of the harmonic quad. Right? The harmonic quad will tell you QB against QC is equal to BG against GC, so GD will also be an angle bisector. So in summary, GD bisector, QD bisector, but also isogonal, isogonal. So that gives you the two angle bisectors, and uh, that's it. Yeah, so this is like the maximally short solution. I, um, it took this problem has been floating around in like as a proposal for a while, so I've had a lot of time to think about it, and like this is the version from like last week. Like I, 
I didn't even- I found the harmonic chord, but I had the point like T marked in the diagram, where T is EF intersects BC. This is a point that's really well behaved because it lies on like Q, P, D, G, and you can use it to angle chase and whatever. Um, it was until like last week when I was- not even last week. Is today Tuesday? I lost track. Sorry. Monday was yesterday, right? Today's Tuesday. Yeah, it wasn't until yesterday I realized you could just get rid of the point T because I was explaining the solution to someone else and I was like, wait a minute, I don't even need the point T anymore. I can just grab it like this. So, this is the entire solution and that's it. Yeah. Problem 3 is Geo. <laughs> what was my score on this question? How should I know? I don't know your ID number, and you should definitely not tell me. Cool. Any questions on the problem too before I go on? Yeah, the protected Q is really nice. Uh, it took me a really long time to simplify it down to just one line like this. Um, like, the, my original solution was probably like three times longer than this. Just introduce all the points and da, 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 da. but you can get it in one shot like this. How does this finish again? Um, so QD is a bisector and then QG and QM are isogonal because they're semidian median. So what that means is that QD will bisect the angle GQM. Like bisector, isogonal. And then you do the same thing at G. Okay, so that's it. Alright, cool. So, uh, here's problem 3. <sighs> Honestly, I was worried this would be too easy for its spot, but I think people do not find this true. <laughs> I think... Alright, what, what comments do I want to make about this problem? Degenerate triangles exist? No, they don't. I just wanted to make sure that no one bothered with them. Yeah. So... Yeah, I want to say, I feel like this is really a problem where, like, you don't need a, like... You don't need an idea that comes out of nowhere. Like, when you look at the solution, I think there's no point at which you can point to something and say, like, wow, this was, like, a surprising idea. Like, I feel like the whole solution, um, you kind of follow... If you've done enough problems, if you have your intuition about how polynomials behave, how fractions behave, and so on, then what you can sort of do is you can... Um, you sort of follow your feelings the whole time, and if you've developed the right instincts, your instincts will tell you what to do. I think that's what I want to say. Like. It's the kind of problem that I would be good at, I'll put it that way. Like, it's the, the kind of problem where, like, I don't have an excuse for missing it if I miss it. <laughs> Maybe I'll just say that. Okay, so, let me get into this. Yeah. Okay, sorry, there is one other thing you need to do. You need to keep- you need to keep calm and not mess up. Because... It's a- like... Under contest pressure, this is the kind of problem that's easy where you can just like, if you're under a lot of pressure, you just might not solve it even if you feel like you, even if you quote unquote should know what you're doing. Um, you just kind of have to keep a level head and trust your instincts the whole time. Um, cool. So let me get to this. So the first thing I'm going to do is say like, okay, well, there's three angles, but the angles add up to pi, right? Theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. Uh, I'll just call them alpha, beta, gamma. Who am I kidding? So, um, if there's an integer dependence, then I can use this to get rid of the beta and get a dependence between alpha, gamma, and pi. 
So there will be some integers. I'll just call them like KLM or whatever. K alpha plus L gamma equals like M pi. And because I have sign information, I want to use cosines. So this statement will, is good enough to tell you that cosine K alpha equals cosine L gamma. And if you think a little bit about it, you're not really losing information about this. Um, because if conversely there exists non-zero integers k and l for which this statement is true, um, then alpha and gamma will also have some relation, some relation to pi. And if there's a relation to pi, you can force it into a relation of the angles. So you can really think of the condition just like the angles are dependent either with each other or with with pi. Take your pick. And here we are. Um, cos two k alpha equals cos two l gamma. Oh, is that true? Yeah. Okay, fine. 2k. Uh, here, I'm just going to double m because I don't need it. <laughs> well, the point is you get a integer relation. I don't care at all what the coefficients are. It's just the problem is saying you have an integer relation. And if you have an integer relation, then it's saying that the cosine of alpha and cosine of gamma are related. Um, so at this point, you're like, okay, well, you can also just compute cosine alpha, right? Cosine alpha, I'll just say, it turns out to be n minus 4 over 2n minus 2. And oh my god, here we go again. All right, one moment, please. Oh, freaking. How is there not... Oh my god. Okay. So I'm going to take cos alpha and gamma because these two are actually like look symmetric. You can, in principle, maybe use beta, but I mean, there's no reason not to use these two. These are the cleaner ones. Um, so here's the thing, like you, if you know cosine of alpha, you can compute cosine of k alpha. Um, like factor of k. So you may or may not know that there are some relations that relate to cosines. I'm going to write up a few ones just for concreteness, like cosine, there's a double angle formula that says that cos 2x is 2 cosine squared x minus 1. And there's a cos, there's a triple angle that goes 4 cosine cubed x minus 3 cosine x. And I don't know any of the ones after that. Um, but my point is that there is such a polynomial. And so what I get is the sum polynomial here for cos alpha which will be n minus 4 over 2n minus 2, will equal some polynomial evaluated at n plus 4 over 2n plus 2. Where pk... So I do actually need to know a tiny bit about these. I'm going to use the following statement. pk and pl um, have integer coefficients with leading coefficients to the k minus one and two to the l minus one. Okay, so we get this equation and this equation is what we in the business call real sus because you look at these denominators. What's going wrong here? These denominators should basically always be relatively prime. If you can't see it with the numbers, I'll plot, I'll choose like a random n for you. Um, so e.g., if n equals 10, then like pk of uh, 6 over 18. Oh wait, that's not a grid. Wait, how does that reduce to? Let, let me choose like 20. Um, I agree that normalization makes it easier. I'm just trying to not introduce too much notation. I do, if you look in the official solution that I will eventually post, it will have that normalization for Spartacle. Um, four sevenths. So easy if I take n equals 20, this is what the equation looks like. And if you believe that pk of integer polynomials, um, no way, right? Thank you, virus936 for the sub. Er, not sub, uh, follow. Uh, yeah, this doesn't look good. 
But like you have this 19 here, you have the 7 here. These things will keep, those denominators are not going away. These denominators are going to stay there, and you know, there's no way they're equal. So yeah, th this equation is super sus. Like you look at this and like for most values of n, it doesn't seem like this should be possible, like at all. So let's make this precise. Claim uh, no odd prime divides the simplified denominators of n minus 4 to n minus 2 or n plus 4 to n plus 2. And the reason is that the reason is that if like the GCD of 2n minus 2 to n plus 2 is at most 4. So if you have an odd prime that divides one of the denominators, it will not divide the other denominator and then because these are integer coefficients where the leading coefficient doesn't have any factors of p, your denominators of p will never cancel out and then everything blows up. Now this claim is so strong because what happens, well, the other thing is that the GCD of n minus 4 and 2n minus 2 is at most 6. So the, the worst thing that can happen is that there's like a factor of 3 that cancels, and other than that, the fraction will mostly not cancel. Um, that's true. There is one exception, and this is for unless k or l is strictly greater than 0. Which, by this I mean that if the integer here, if one of the integers is 0, then you know, it's plausible, because the, poly the polynomial could be the constant polynomial. Um, and I'll just say that this gives, oh, sorry, yeah, if kl greater than zero, and if, if you actually have zero, um, that tells you the cosines are rational, and you can do whatever you want, um, quote Niven's theorem for all I care, <laughs> yeah. So in the kl equals zero case, there is one solution that n equals four. And otherwise, um, what happens is 2n minus 2 and 2n plus 2 must both be in the set like 1, 2, 4, 8, or they must either be a power of 2 or 3 times a power of 2. Uh, you made this problem? Yeah, this is yeah, um, my problem. And this won't happen very often. You might have that sense. Uh, well, actually, 2n minus 2 and then 2n plus 2 are... <laughs> because what will happen is that you'll get some very normal Diophantine equations, right? Um, like... So let me copy this claim. Like, if they're both powers of 2, I think you get n equals 3. I think that's the only one. Like, no, the only powers of 2 that differ by 4 are 4 and 8. Now, you could also have, suppose 2n minus 2 is like 3 times a power of 2, and 2n plus 2 is like a power of 2. Um, then, you know, you can boil this down. This will tell you that 2 to the something. Let me make sure I get this right. 2 to the something minus 3 is like 2 to a different thing. Sorry, no, 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 no. Just subtract, right? 4 is equal to 2 to the something minus 3 times 2 to the something. Okay, that's fine. You divide out relevant factors of 2, and now not much is going to happen. Um, you'll eventually boil down to like 2 to the power minus 1 equals 3. This is a Dalfantine equation that you probably have seen something similar to before because you just factor the difference of squares and etc. So uh, for the sake of not being too boring because people have written full solutions, I'll just tell you that um, this extracts the answers n equals 3. Basically only small cases will happen. You work out what the small cases are. You get n equals 3, 4, 5, 7 as the candidates. And in fact, all of these work.
Yeah, why do these all work? The 2, 3, 4 triangle, I think, just has a 120 degree angle. Uh, 3, 4, 5 has a right angle. 4, 5, 6 has angle B equals 2 angle C or something like that. I forget what the one for uh, 6, 7, 8 is. What's the 6, 7, 8 relation? Uh, no, wait, sorry. I'm, I'm being silly. This is not right. Oh, uh, shoot. All right, what was it? Uh, okay, let's check my notes. Instead of trying to do it in an edit. A plus 2B is 120. Something like this. Uh, okay, so I'm doing it this way for concreteness, but honestly, it's easier to check with the polynomials, and that's what happens in my solution, where what you need to do is you need to find a value of k and a value of l, for which when I plug in the correct val the relevant value of n, um, you know, something happens. And... Okay, actually, since this is now confusing people, I will do it properly. Um, so, this was the equation we wanted, right? You don't need to get the relation between the angles exactly, you just need to get an equation of this form. So, 2, 3, 4, uh, for n equals, this is n equals 3, has p2 of minus 1 half equals p1. p1 is the identity of minus 7 quarters. Uh, let's, let me make sure that's right. Think. Thank you, answer for the follow-up. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of off my factors of two. One quarter, seven eighths. This is why I should just follow my notes. N equals four has P of two, three quarters is one eighth. Okay, I'm not even going to put the P1 because the P1 just looks dumb. N equals, this is N equals five, N equals seven. Thank you, the baby, for the follow. One half equals minus eleven eighths. So this is 357. If you do it this way, then you can do it just with the Chebyshev polynomials. You only need the first two that I actually remember, like 2x squared minus 1 and 4x cubed minus 3x. And then, um, yeah, you just check it. So because of this, you'll get a relation. You don't need to reverse engineer exactly what the relation is with respect to the triangle. You just need to do this. Okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and write n equals 4. Um, n equals 4 has a 90 degree angle. So that's the solution set. Now, if you've been paying attention to like various social media, uh, there is a generalization of this problem that... Is this formulas? I don't really think so. I think it's super empty. I think it's like the situation where, as I said at the beginning, um, you don't need an idea that surprises anyone. When people read the solution, there's nothing that jumps out at them as, oh, that was like... Like, you know. There's, I think with a lot of Olympiad problems, there's like this like big jump, you know, like where you we go from like not soft to soft. And I think for this problem, it feels a lot. That big jump doesn't feel quite as big. Like the big jump, I think, is when you realize that this equation is sus. But everything up to here is, like, everything up to here doesn't require, um, a. It doesn't require a special idea. Like it doesn't require an idea that's specific to this problem. And even recognizing that this equation is not going to work out for almost all values of n um, is something that you can see right away if you have the experience. Like when I see this equation and I know that the pk of integer coefficients, I like I can I like feel my test chest tighten. I'm just like like no 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 kind of thing. Um, and that's a that's a lot of what like experience is. It's not necessarily like knowing things, like. It's not knowing, necessarily just knowing things in the sense that like you can say certain things are true or false. It's also having the right instincts, like being able to look at this equation and immediately be like, something is wrong. Um, that's a lot of what you're trying to de develop when you're trying to develop instincts during training. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Anyways, what I was saying was that if you're paying attention to social media, uh, you might notice that there is a generalization that has been touted uh, where you can say, find rather than find all quirky triangles with... Uh, let's, let me put this... So the original problem asks for all quirky triangles with silence n-1 and n-1, but you can in fact do the following problem where you find all quirky triangles with side lengths are integers in arithmetic progression. You don't need to modify this approach too much. This is basically the same as if you let n equals x over y. Um, the equation that you'll get down, boiled down to is something like this. Uh, 2x plus 2y. If you try to follow through on the generalization, you'll end up with this equation instead, which is this equation is going to be really bad for roughly the same reasons, but there's slightly more cases to consider because y can now be anything. You assume that gc x y equals 1 because you can divide out, blah blah blah. Um, and <laughs> if you solve, I'll tell you what the solution set is. So all the ones that we had before are still there. So the 2, 3, 4 triangle, uh, the 3, 4, 5 triangle, uh, the 4, 5, 6 triangle, the 5, 6, uh, yeah, 6, 7, 8 triangle. In addition, of course you have the equilateral triangle. You know, those have that has very dependent angles. You additionally gain the 3, 5, 7 triangle. This is the one that has the 120 degree angle. Um, yeah, this has a 120 degree angle. Just random trivia. And um, finally, the 6, 11, 16 triangle which apparently satisfies like angle B equals 3A plus angle 4C or something. <laughs> yeah, so, man, like, on the one hand, I, I wish I had like thought to replace N with a rational number, but on the other hand, I think if this was the solution set, uh, I would get a lot of um, not so happy comments after the exam. <laughs> 6, 11, 16. Who do you? And that's the complete set. There are no other triangles with... I mean, obviously you can scale up these triangles, but there's no other triangles with, uh, integer arithmetic progression coefficients. Yeah. So, there you go. Yeah, it's the 2611 energy. I mean, I think it's good because you look at this and you're like, oh, I, I bet the answer is just like 111 and 345, and then there's like six more ads. I don't know. Yeah, it really reminds, it reminds me of IMO 2015 too, but I like to think this problem is nicer. Um, maybe? <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, people were referring to IMO 2015 too, which was the other time that the IMO had a problem where the solution set was uh, way bigger than people thought. I don't know. <sighs> yeah, I'm a little sad that I did not think up of this generalization myself. Uh, to give credit, uh, Luke was the one who came up with it. He's been posting it in like the mock Discord and other places. Um, but on the other hand, I s from the looks of it, it sounds like this problem might have been too hard anyways. Yeah, yeah. That's what I said, right? Uh, yeah, this is Luke's generalization. So I was saying I was sad that I didn't come up with it so I could put it up on the test, but on the other hand, like, uh, too hard? Well, I actually thought was worried the problem was too easy for the test. No, 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 I said Luke. Like, Luke, Luke Robotel. Uh, yeah, but I, I was worried the problem would be too easy, actually, because I was looking at this and I was like, there's, there's only one part that I would call an aha moment, and it's something you can do if you just have the right intuition. Um, but, I don't know. The test offers thought it was hard, and then the students also thought it was hard, so. So I guess it's fine that the version was given with N, because I think, I think if you give this problem, like, everyone gets scared to death, and then, like, two people solve it, or something like that. If you give n, like, you know, it, it suggests more that you are supposed to actually use the law of cosines. Whereas if you give this, it's just like, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> I, 
I, I think phrasing it with N makes it a lot more clear that you're supposed to go after the cosines. Yeah. Alright, so that concludes the STST review. I didn't solve any problems. Did you, did you request a problem? Oh man, are you serious? What was the problem you requested? What's the TSTST schedule this year? Um, basically there's one day in November, one day in December, and one day in January, and... Uh, I will, I will link you. Yeah, because TSTST did not happen at MOP because MOP barely happened at all. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, there's no separate Winter TST, although, like, basically the RMM and the APMO are now the Winter TST. I think there's a good chance that the RMM will get cancelled, just because the world is dying, and if that happens, then we will have the... Uh, then I need to find three more problems, <laughs> which I think I can do, but yeah, it's, it's gonna be a weird year. Yeah, they were, they were before, um, but yeah, if RMM gets cancelled, uh, which is all definitely on the table, um, then... Yeah, then I need to find three more problems. This was not designed to be TST level hard. I mean... I don't know, I just write test. Virtual RMM? That's possible too. I mean, we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, yeah, if it's virtual, then it's virtual and we'll take it. If there's no RMM at all, then... No, there's no RMM. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, it'd be nice if there's a virtual event, but I think everyone is feeling very tired right around now. Mo's ratings, uh... <sighs> I, I... I've, I put 10, 25, and like... What did I put for Form 3? It's, it sounds like problem 3 is at least 40, because... Yeah. I looked at past stats, and if cutoff last year was 25, that was... more than top 24, so is there a reason for that? The cutoff is not exactly top 24. The cutoff is approximately 24, where we care more about making the cut clean than being close to 24. So, like... Um, yeah. Like, if very often the TSTST to TST cutoff in a normal year, the cut is like between like solving n problems and solving n minus 1 problems. Like, we'll pick the cutoff threshold such that the people that solve so and so problems make it, and the people who solve one less than that don't make it. Like, I did 1, 2, and ran out of time at 3. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I will I will not really have too much of an opinion until I see the score distributions. Uh, because... That, that will sort of give me a reality check. Like right now, I'm just based going based on of like my own personal solve experience. But until I see what the papers look like, you know, I'm just... Problem difficulty is so personal that I think it's hard to um, do anything without having looked at the stats. Um, sometimes I will like look at the stats and think about it and then come up with a reason why I don't think the stats tell the whole story, but I will usually not have an opinion until after I see the stats.